I needed a new speed square. I was building a hearth for my wood-burning stove in our former home. I couldn't find the one I knew that I had. I think what I had done is just literally built it into the thing and covered over it. Uh, so I needed a new speed square. I went to Ace Hardware. It was the closest hardware store. And it just so happened that I was wearing um, uh, blue, blue jeans and a red shirt. If you've ever been to Ace, you know that <laughs> that's the uniform there. And I was standing in a hand tool aisle and just, you know, kind of looking and evaluating, do I want this one, do I want that one, plastic, aluminum, metal, whatever, you know. And this lady, who I'd never met before in my life, walked up to me. And, and she just started talking. She didn't even say hi, just started talking. And she was like, hi, um, I, you know, it's supposed to get cold soon, and we want to get the yard mowed one more time before it gets cold, and I've got this, uh, this part that I need to find for my mower, and I've been looking all over the store, and I can't find it, but I need this part, and I really want to get this done before it gets uh, too cold. Can you help me? I was like, uh, I don't work here. <laughs> and she, she turned as red as my shirt. She's like, I'm so sorry, and went away, you know, like, and, and ran off. I'm like, lady, I'll help you. Look, I just don't know where, you know, the part is. I'm sorry, uh, you know. You ever done that? Or maybe, maybe you made the mistake of wearing a, a red polo and khakis to Target, right? <laughs> like, I don't, I don't work here. I, you know, my shift is, uh, anyway, um, you know, there, there's, <sighs> here's the thing. It is vital that we recognize that as Christians, we wear the uniform of our Lord, Everywhere we go. We're going to talk about that today. Thanks for being with us, uh, both on-site and online. Grateful for, for that. Open your Bibles to Ephesians 6, 19. That's where we're going to start today. Uh, while you're doing that, uh, let me orient you to what we're talking about. We're, we're continuing our sermon series today called Life Imitates Art, inverting the common proverb, art imitates life. That art often reflects culture, but it also has the power to shape culture. So we've been looking at four different images, the art, if you will, that the New Testament uses to describe the Christian life. And through this series, we've asked you to engage the issue by dressing the part. Uh, today's image is that of an ambassador. So last Sunday, we asked you uh, to dress up either real fancy, like you're going to a, a fancy ambassadorial function, right? Or it depend, if you've got an, an ethnic or national heritage that you're proud of, uh, to, to, or that you know something about, to, to engage the image by, by wearing the part, which is the reason I'm dressed like this. Uh, th that's the reason this Scott is wearing a kilt today, uh, but not the only reason. Uh, the other reason is that uh, Wendell Asato, who you saw on stage in our choir, kind of sort of dared me to do it. Uh, <laughs> or maybe it's a bet, I don't know. Anyway, he said, he's like, he, I don't know if you saw, he was wearing a tux with his medals, he's a veteran. And he looked on the Department of State's website and what are the instructions for going to a fancy ambassadorial function if you're a veteran. And, and so he, you wear a tux with your medals in a certain way. And, and he did today. And he goes, I'll do that if you wear your kilt. Okay. <laughs> so that, that, that's why uh, for this. And it's just, it's a fun thing, right? It's, it's to remind us. Here's the thing. The image of an ambassador is not frequently used in the Old Testament, or in the New Testament rather, but it is very, very important. So it, it doesn't happen often, but when it does, these are majorly important passages that shape our Christian life. Paul uses the image twice in his writings, so just two times. When he wrote to the church at Ephesus, he asked them to pray for him. Look at what he says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 19. Pray also for me, that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. You didn't chain up ambassadors in the ancient world. That's a great way to start a war. Paul recognizes that he is at war against the principalities and powers of this dark world. And he says that he's an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Now, several years earlier, Paul wrote another letter to the church at Corinth, and this is the passage that we're really going to spend more of our time with today. Look with me at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting in verse 16. 2 Corinthians 5, 16. Paul writes, So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view, though we once regarded Christ in this way. 
I want you to, let me pause right there real quick and just say, once you become a Christian, you don't look at Jesus the same way the world looks at Jesus. You have to look at Jesus differently, right? Once you're a Christian, you don't, you don't perceive that the same way. He says, once we regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So what is that ministry? Here's the next verse that describes it. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Y'all, I don't know where you're at in your journey with the spiritual disciplines and memorizing scripture, but if I could put a, a, a Bible verse on your list to memorize, it would be 2 Corinthians 5.21. I, I think every Christian needs to have this committed to, to memory. Um, it, like it's literally in my top three Bible verses of the all whole Bible, this is number three. It's John 3.16, Matthew 10.38 and 39, 2 Corinthians 5.21. I mean, I, it, it's that fundamental to who we are. But Paul goes on, and I think, I think even though it's a chapter division, I think the thought continues. He says, as God's co-workers. Now, he has called us into the ministry of reconciliation. We're participating in his mission, right? And what's the very next thing? We're his co-workers. We're part of this. As God's co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, in the time of my favor, I heard you. And in the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you, Paul says, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. Now, the word translated ambassador in both of those passages means to function as a representative of a ruling authority. So I want you to hear this, this note of urgency in what Paul is saying here, right? He understands that there, people's eternity is at stake. And when we understand this image, this art, and apply it to our life, it will lend urgency to our efforts to seek and save the lost by making disciples that make disciples, if you're new here at Chapel Rock, um, you might not know this, but, and, and for those who've been around for a bit, let me remind you, every night at 8.20, if you're with Chapel Rock people, their phones go off. Because I've urged you to put a reminder in your phone every night at 8.20, that's 2020 military time, that's our address here. 8.20 p.m. to pray that our church would seek and save the lost by making disciples that make disciples. That's the whole prayer. If you want to add more to it, Awesome. But very often, like when our life group is together, everybody's phones go off at 820. We'd stop what we're doing, usually with something with food, um, <laughs> and, uh, and pray together. I mean, it's such a simple prayer. My, my you know, seven-year-old son can pray this prayer, and he does, and he reminds us, Dad, it's 820. Oh, okay, we've got to pray. To seek and save the lost by making disciples that make disciples. There's an urgency here for Paul. Why? Because we are representatives of the King of kings and Lord of lords. And he has called us into his mission with him. See, over the last few weeks, we've looked at a couple other images. We, we talked about being a farmer a couple weeks ago. A lot of people know a farmer. We talked about being a soldier last week. A lot of people know a soldier. Next week is athlete, so we encourage you to wear your you know, jersey or whatever you want to, some kind of sporting thing, you know, yay, sports ball, whatever, um, whatever, whatever you want to do that way. But ambassador is a little... Less well known, right? Like we don't, like, have any of you here, here ever met an ambassador? Yeah, I didn't think so. I, I didn't meet an ambassador from our country, but I, I'm, I have a friend who worked for him. So um, I, I was, went to high school with a girl named Valerie. She married a guy named Hart, H-A-R-T. Hart Nelson is his name, so Valerie Nelson. I don't remember her maiden name. And at a, my high school reunion, we had a chance to inter interact. And I just, I was, I was like, dude, you're an ambassador. He's like, I'm not the, I worked for him, I think, in the Czech Republic. So he was over in Europe for several years. I just thought that was so fascinating. I was kind of blown away by that. And I'm like, tell me about it. So I'm asking him all these questions about what it means to be an ambassador and what that's like and, and what it's like to represent your government or ruler, in the case of like a monarchy, in another country. 
I learned so much from him, and, and a lot of that filtered into this message. Hart and Valerie were able to give me great insight into something that's kind of foreign to most of us, pun intended, right? Because I, th- there's, this has deep application to our spiritual lives. And, and here's what I think will be helpful to you today. A major part of the Christian life is being an ambassador of Jesus to your relational network. Now, the relational network is everybody that you know. This is your family. This is the people in your cul-de-sac, your street. These are your coworkers, friends at school, right? This is everybody that you know. This is uh, people that you work out with at the gym. Everybody. This is anybody God has put in your life, right? Parable of the Good Samaritan, right? Who is my neighbor? Anybody God puts in your life. That's who your neighbor is. So you're, the, the, Jesus is calling you to be his ambassador to your relational network. And the Lord, I think, has given us this image to remind us of this task. So, so part of my challenge for you today is, is to put this thing in front of you about what it means to be an ambassador for Jesus. Here's our big idea this morning. Ready? Our lives are to be an embassy of the kingdom of God no matter where we are or what we're doing. What happens at an embassy? The values of that country are expressed in a foreign land, right? That's what happens at an embassy. The values and priorities of, of that, the, 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 the native country are expressed in a foreign place. Your life is an embassy of the kingdom of God. That's what it means to be an ambassador of Jesus, As I learned from my friend Hart, the job of an ambassador is to represent their government or head of state in a foreign place. We don't represent ourselves, we represent him. Some of you are dressed today in a way that represents your country of origin. You're you're kind of representing that. That's kind of what I'm doing here. Though my family's been in America longer than it was been America. (laughs) It's a long time, Uh, pre-1776 for us. But our job is to represent the values and, 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 and um, priorities of another place. In the season one, episode eight of the Netflix series, The Crown, which is a drama that, that chronicles the life of Queen Elizabeth II of England, the queen travels to Ceylon on a diplomatic tour, and she appoints her sister, Princess Margaret, to be her representative for minor royal engagements while she's gone. Princess Margaret, who has long been unhappy with her sister's lack of flair as the queen, she says that she wants to bring some color and personality to the monarchy. She's not happy with this. And so she speaks her own mind and she jokes with the press and she belittles other dignitaries. And in one scene, the Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, has come to rebuke the princess and relieve her of her duties as representative of the nation of England and the United Kingdom. He explains to her that she was not appointed to represent herself. And here, let me just condense the conversation a little bit. Prime Minister Churchill says, Your Royal Highness, when you appear in public performing official duties, you are not you. And she says, what do you mean? Of course I'm me. And his response is, the crown. They don't come to see you. They come to see the crown. You represent the crown. Our identity as ambassadors of our King Jesus to all the people we know is to, to, we're his ambassadors to our relational network. That's who we are. That's what he calls us to do. That God has given us the task of fearlessly representing his redemptive appeal to the world. So how do we do that? How do we serve as ambassadors? I wish it was as easy as buying a cheap kilt on Amazon and wearing it at church. It's not. It it, it ends up being a lot harder. But it's better. It's more important. So how do we serve as ambassadors? I think this New Testament image suggests that we represent two values of the kingdom to our relational network. Here's the first one. We represent the king's fearless hope. We represent the king's fearless hope. Paul says that when we see ourselves as ambassadors for Jesus, because of his redemptive work in our lives, we have this gospel imperative to share the good news that, that, that we, with all the people that we interact with in our whole life. That we have to look at people through that perspective, that we represent the king's fearless hope about humanity. Like, what are you talking about? Let me give you another example. Mark Twain once said, travel 
is fatal to prejudice, bigotry, and narrow-mindedness, and many of our people need it sorely on these accounts. Broad, wholesome, charitable views of men and things cannot be acquired by vegetating in one little corner of the earth all one's lifetime. I think he's right. The, 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 the being out there and interacting with, you know, expanding your relational network intentionally, making a choice to expand your relational network helps you represent the king's fearless hope in humanity. There's a winsomeness to that perspective. I hope you've had the opportunity to meet someone who who is, like, they're really grounded, but they're also really positive. I don't know about you, but when I meet people like that, I want to be around them, and I want to be like them, right? That they're, they're, they're realistic about the world. They understand the world that they're living in, right? But, but they're, they're really grounded, like, they, they, they get where they are, but they're positive. They, they, they have this sense of hope and optimism about the world. Paul says, pray for me that I can do that. He tells the church at Ephesus, pray for me that I can do this. He, that he will fearlessly put forth the hope that we have in Jesus. You see, in, in ancient times, a, a philosopher was, was praised, was valued because of their, the word here is boldness is what Paul's praying for, but it was their, their frank and open speech. One of the things I learned from my friend uh, Hart is, is as an ambassador, you, you have to be kind, you have to be tactful, but you absolutely have to tell the truth. You've you've got to be both. You're representing your government. And so you cannot be unclear about something. You have to be crystal clear. Be kind, be tactful, put it in a way that they can accept it, but be very, very clear about what's going on. And that's what Paul is saying. He said, pray for me that I can do that. And I think we should pray for each other that we can do that too. You know, today you had a a sign-up opportunity to sign up to be part of a group out in the lobby. This is something that you can bring to your life group, that you can bring to your Sunday morning group to say, hey, I'm I'm talking with, uh, let's just pick a guy, Jonathan at the gym. And I'm I'm, I'm trying to make a connection with Jonathan. Would you pray for me that I could be, be bold, right? Which is tactful but clear. And you just, you ask, can you help, help do that? That's what Paul is saying here. It, it, takes, it takes this kind of fearless hope to be part of that. We represent the king's fearless hope in this situation to make known the mystery of the gospel. Jesus, I believe, is calling us to see the potential in every person's life, right? To see what God could do in them if they would yield their lives to him and surrender, Can I challenge you, instead of thinking about people's brokenness, to think about what they could be if they became whole? To regard people that way, to think about the what what could they become? If Jesus really got a hold of somebody, what could they be? And then begin to treat them that way and regard them that way. That'll change the way you interact with people. It it, it enables you to, to have a voice into their lives in ways that you might otherwise not have. See, when that perspective dominates your view, this fearless hope that God can work in someone's life, it changes the way you interact your relation, with your relational network. You begin thinking like an ambassador. See, the way an ambassador thinks is this. What could happen in this place if they had a more favorable view of those I represent? That's how an ambassador thinks. And I would encourage you to begin to have that view, that mindset in your family, at home, with your neighbors, across the cul-de-sac or the fence, with your coworkers and classmates, with your friends, with people at the gym, wherever you hang out. What could happen in this place if these people had a more favorable view of the one I represent? the one for whom I am an ambassador. That changes the whole way you engage with the world. And so part of my challenge for you today is to begin to help you think that way, to to be an ambassador of Jesus and regard people the way he thinks about them. 
with this fearless hope. Yes, we are made in the image of God and that image is broken and corrupted by our own sin. But God loved you so much that he sent Jesus to die on the cross in your place for your sin to make you whole, to make you redeemed. And he calls you into that mission with him. And when you begin to see the world with that perspective, it really helps you put away, as Mark Twain said, prejudice, bigotry, and narrow-mindedness. And really love people the way Jesus does. Because to, have, to represent the king's fearless hope is only part of the equation. The other part of it is that we represent the king's mission of reconciliation. The mission of reconciliation. Now the word that Paul uses here, reconciliation, uh, was often used of a couple, a man and a woman, who'd kind of had some trouble in their marriage. And separated, but worked it out, and came back together. They reconciled. That was the most common usage of that word in, in, in Paul's world. So he's kind of got that behind his eyes a little bit. When he talks about reconciling, he's talking about people who were at odds and who have come back together. Right, verse 18 says that God reconciled us to himself, and the result of being reconciled is that we begin to be agents of reconciliation in our world. Th this word reconciled there is only used a few times in the New Testament, but it it really is a significant word, right? It means to put things back together again, to put people who were at odds back together again. I love how Clarence Jordan, who translated the cotton patch version of the Bible, if you've ever heard of this, it's, he took the New Testament and he said it in America, in the South, in the 30s. Now this guy started an interracial farm in America's Georgia in the 30s. Once you think, yeah, wow, exactly, Wow. Um, deep heart for reconciliation. And this was how he translated 2 Corinthians 5.18. God was in Christ hugging the world to himself. Parents, you ever try to hug a stiff kid? Hard to do, right? But you hold on to him long enough. If your will is stronger than theirs, and they will eventually relax. That's what God is doing and he's using you to do it. That's what God is doing through us, reconciling the world to himself, hugging the world to himself. That in Jesus, God took your default relationship with him, which was broken by sin and by selfishness. And he exchanged it for a right working relationship by Jesus' death for you on the cross. Because we've been given that as a gift, Paul says, we need, we've been called to express that to the world. As ambassadors, we're simply carrying out God's work of reconciliation. And when you've experienced the new life that Jesus gives, you are going to intentionally and boldly and constantly be an ambassador for Jesus. See, there, that's one part of it to it. There's a second part, though, and it's, it's this. Even more than Jake and Elwood blues, right? We're on a mission from God. <laughs> On the cross, Jesus of Nazareth, God in the flesh, who is sinless and perfect, became the physical embodiment of our sin. I, I told you before that 2 Corinthians 5.21 is like one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. What that means is that on the cross, Jesus became the physical embodiment of sin, that God was able to pour out all his wrath for all sin, for all time on the person of Jesus. And he did that for you. On the cross, Jesus suffered for your sins. And so here in a little bit, if you've not made a decision to give him your life, if nothing else, in gratitude, you're going to have an opportunity to do that. In just, when we, in just a few minutes when we stand and sing together, for you to come forward and say, I want Jesus to be my Lord. I want to yield my life to him. I want to be his ambassador in the world. You're going to have a chance to do that in a little while. But there is a, because there is a presentness to this image, isn't there? Paul says, now is the day of salvation. Now is the time. It's right now that we need to be involved in this mission right now. See, here's where the rubber hits the road. There are some similarities between being an ambassador in Paul's time and being an ambassador in our time. But one thing that, ha like, for, like you don't put them in chains, that's one thing. But one thing that has not changed is this. The one thing that's totally identical is this. The bigger and more powerful the ruler or country, the more important the ambassador is. I learned this from my friend Hart who served with our foreign service in Europe. The bigger and more powerful the ruler or country is, the more important the ambassador. Because of the size of America, the United States' military, because of the size of our economy, because of the global influence that we wield, 
Nobody mistreats an ambassador from the United States of America. They just don't do that. So, who do you represent? You are a child, a son, a daughter of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Your ruler is the master of all that is, the creator of the universe, the King Almighty. You represent him. The more important the ruler, the more important the ambassador. (laughs) What that means, church, is that what you do in this life matters. What you do, the way you behave and the way you live at work or at school or at the gym or on the golf course, those things matter because you are representing the King of kings and Lord of lords how you use your gifts and the resources God has put in your life matter, and they matter now. Our great God has gifted you uniquely to represent him to your family and your friends and your coworkers and your classmates and your neighbor and your community. Only you can represent God in your life. (laughs) He's he's only got one ambassador in your life, and they're sitting in your seat. It's you. So you have to do that, and you have to do it now. Now, I had hoped that we could get uh, an ambassador uh, to be with us today. Um, There we go. I was wondering where that went. Thank you, Jason. Appreciate that. But uh, we don't have an ambassador from another country, but we have an ambassador of Jesus in another country. Would you welcome Jorge Lugo to Chapel Rock today? Good to see you. Thank you. God bless you. So glad you're here. Thank you. So, like I said, Jorge is not an ambassador uh, of of, uh, America. Uh, he is an ambassador of Jesus in Venezuela. So, hey, so there's some folks here who don't, yeah, don't know who you are. Amen, yeah. Um, for those who don't know, kind of tell us a little bit about who you are, what you're doing. Okay, perfect. Uh, well, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, my name is Jorge. Is it George? Jorge Lugo. <laughs> <laughs> my wife um, name's Diana. She's, she's a missionary kid. Um, that's why we got connected. I got connected through, through her family, and they came many years ago to evangelize my whole family. Uh, I married Diana, and we got two kids, Josh and Jacob, and we are serving the Lord. We decided to go back to Venezuela many years ago, and we're planting churches in Caracas, Venezuela, really close to Colombia and Brazil. Okay, all right. So I don't know if you know this or not, in 2019, the United States uh, suspended uh, diplomatic relationships with Venezuela. It, the relationship between our two countries is not, it's not good. Um, and and I just, I'm, I'm Gen X. I was kind of born as a skeptic. Um, so I'm a little skeptical of any media reports from, from either side. So what are things really like there? You, you're, you're th- I mean, you're here now, but you're going back soon. You're there a lot. What are things really like in Venezuela? Well, in the last years, it, it was a lot of political unrest. A lot of people fighting in the street, and that's why the embassy decided to, to leave the country. And the president wasn't uh, recognized by many countries anymore. That's why you know, the U.S. embassy left the country. But in the last three years, many Venezuelans lost the hope to get something new, a new government, and they start fleeing the country. So that many people left the country, more than six million Venezuelan people left the country, and they keep continued leaving the country every, every day, basically. Wow, okay. So, so tell us about your ministry there. You're representing Jesus. You're, you're an ambassador of Jesus in Venezuela. Tell us about what that looks like for you day in, day out. Okay. Um, well, thinking about that question, uh, I want to share some, something that that I, I remember, I think it's very funny. And I, I used to be in Venezuela a police officer many years ago. And so it's, it is very normal to have like checkpoints with police officers, but there's so many kidnappings and many, many uh, dangerous situations in the city. So you got always like checkpoints of police officers every two blocks. So there was a, 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 a checkpoints, and they asked me for papers on my car and things. And there's the two guys from the police that I used to work, but new guys. So I just want to, you know, get opportunity. And they said, do you have any weapon in there? 
I said, Jeff, I have some weapons. How, how many do you have? They start checking my cars, and they just find out that I got a lot of Bibles. <laughs> So, where's the weapon? That's my weapon. So, ah, weapon. you think it's funny? Yes, yes. <laughs> you think it's funny? So, they want to give me a hard time. But I knew, you know, the, the, the boss from then. So, they, they say, what is your profession? What do you do for a living? And they start asking me for papers and just say, I am an ambassador. So, they say, <laughs> what? So, they got kind of nervous because if you are an ambassador, ambassador, nobody can touch you. They can even stop your car. So, they got kind of nervous and they went to call the, the supervisors and bring it back. And then it was my, one of my partners. And I said, Jorge, what are you doing, man? <laughs> what are you doing? You're teasing these new guys. I said, I just have a fun, man. I just want to invite them to the church. So uh, it was an opportunity for me to tell them I'm an ambassador for Christ. And that's what all oh, you got the opportunity every day in your life. There's always a way to spread the gospel, to tell them, you know, Jesus is there. Look for him. So I invite them to church. I don't know if finally they came or not, but... That's what I did. <laughs> yeah. So, like, you know, he could have got shot for that. <laughs> probably you're not going to get shot inviting a friend to church. Pro- probably. Um, so I'm just saying, let, let's, let's all be ambassadors for Jesus. How can, how can we pray for you, brother? Uh, well, pray for the new believers. Mm-hmm. We witness uh, more than 331 people wow. who, who got baptized. God. Awesome. Amen. So praise the Lord for that. <laughs> It was amazing. Between 20, 22, 23, we got so many people getting baptized. So pray for them uh, so they can get connected with the churches so they don't have to leave the country. Provision for our families. Uh, we going back to Venezuela on Thursday. Okay. So pray for my wife. She got the American passport. Um, I have dual citizen, but she only got the American. So pray for her. They always give her like a hard time. Um, she got a temporary permission to get up and to go back to Venezuela for our supplies so we can go through the customs without no problems. And for the new trainings, we, we have the goal for this half of the year to train more than 500 Venezuelans to start teaching them how to start small churches, simple churches. So just like a house church? Yeah, house churches. Okay, mm-hmm. awesome. Let's pray together. God, thank you for Jorge. I'm so grateful, Lord, that you, you ordained this, that you worked out the, the, uh, the logistics so that he could be here today of all days when we're talking about being an ambassador for Christ. And I, and I get to stand next to one of my favorites and one I admire deeply. And I'm just, I'm grateful for him, Jesus. And we just pray your hand of blessing and protection on uh, Jorge and his family as they travel Uh, back to Venezuela this week. We pray for favor with uh, Diana with her passport and that situation and that it would just uh, just breeze right through customs and and the supplies that they're taking back. Lord, we know that there's such an economic hardship there in Venezuela and so they are faithful to take medicines and, and, and things that that their people in their church desperately need. And so I just pray that you would help all those uh, get through customs and get where they need to be to the the families that need them, Lord. And we're so grateful, God. We rejoice 331 baptisms in a couple years. Lord, we just praise you for that. And 500 people, Lord, who are stepping into a, a, a... a training uh, situation where they can learn to make disciples who make disciples who make disciples, that the church can continue to grow and flourish in Venezuela. Lord, we just uh, ask your blessing on this man and his family. Uh, We love you, Jesus, and we thank you, and we look forward to that great day in glory when we're reunited with all our Venezuelan brothers and sisters. We praise you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you, brother. Thank you so much. much. Would you express your appreciation? When I was a student at Ozark Christian College in Joplin, Missouri, uh, we had what was, in my opinion, the dorkiest mascot ever. Uh, so I grew up on campus. My dad taught there for 30 years. And, and as a kid, I thought this, and he, as a, being a student didn't really change my mind. We were the Ozark Christian College ambassadors. Like, what do you do with that? Like, your mascot is a goober. It's a, it's a dude in a suit, right, with a briefcase. Like, it's just weird. Like, all the other Bible colleges had cool mascots, right? The Warriors or the Lions or whatever. We had a guy in a suit. I'm an ambassador. Yeah, it was so dumb. And now it's a guy in a tricorn hat. You know, that's, that's a little better, I guess. Um, I don't know if you saw Mark Wentworth uh, last Sunday. He was, he was dressed like this, uh, you know, for our... our our day on the soldier, he dressed like it was a Revolutionary War uh, guy. It was pretty cool. Um, I don't know. I guess that's an improvement. Uh, but then one day it hit me. 
When God wanted to reconcile us to himself, he didn't send a committee. He didn't send a letter or an email or a Snapchat or whatever. He sent an ambassador. He sent himself. Right? The job of an ambassador is to represent the one that sent them. (laughs) And so when God wanted to reconcile us, he sent an ambassador. Church, he's still doing that. And this time, it's you. For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son. He gave Jesus. He sent Jesus to be his ambassador to us, to redeem us. And now he's sending you as his ambassador. (laughs) to be part of that work of redemption, the ministry of reconciliation. When we participate in the death of Jesus through our weekly communion, we remember that our sin is what caused God to have to send that ambassador. And when we participate in worship each week to our risen Lord, we remember that our King is so great and His love for us is so vast and that He reconciles that broken relationship so completely that He can invite us to represent Him as His ambassadors. You're an ambassador of the King of kings and Lord of lords. Go out there and live like it this week. So who are you reconciling? Maybe it's you. Maybe today you need to be reconciled with God. Maybe you need to be brought into the kingdom. You were part of the kingdom of darkness and now you can become part of the kingdom of light. And so if you've never named Christ as Lord, you're gonna have an opportunity to do that right now, to come forward and confess Christ as Savior and Lord, be baptized, receive God's spirit to live inside you and then be sent out as his ambassador. Maybe you have someone here who's weighing heavily on your heart. Someone that, that you know who's, who's far away from God and, and you realize he is calling you to be an ambassador to them. And maybe you want to pray for them. Maybe you want us to pray that you would be gifted to be able to do that. Well, Pastor Fred and I will be down front. We'd love to pray with you this morning. If you want to talk to one of our leaders, you can go to the next step room and, and have a conversation there about what my, your next step in faith might be. I'm going to ask you to stand with me and we're going to sing together. And you respond as God leads you today.